going to talk about the therapeutic use of genetic testing, uh, and I'm going to talk about both germline and somatic here in advanced prostate cancer. <clears throat> All right, so we've got some audience response questions for this one. So which of these pathways is commonly aberrant in metastatic prostate cancer? So, so say more than 20% of cases. Androgen receptor signaling, DNA repair, cell cycle regulation, PI theokinase pathway, or all of the above? All right, good deal. Which of the following is true regarding the impact of ARV7, and we've heard some about this already this morning, on response to therapy in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer? A, ARV7 predicts for response to enzalutamide, but not abiraterone. B, ARV7 predicts for lack of response to chemotherapy and androgen receptor-directed therapy. Or C, ARV7 has no impact uh, on the response to chemotherapy. Which of these is true? All right, so we got a distribution of answers. <clears throat> All right, so we'll move through this. All right, so the outline here, um, some of this is going to be repetitive, so I'll move through it more quickly and spend some more time uh, on, uh, on other pieces. Okay, so this is the data from the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA. So, you know, hopefully you've heard of this. It's a big nationwide effort looking at a variety of different cancers, uh, really try to get the whole spectrum. And what they do is they gather, gather at least hundreds of cases in each of the cancers and do a comprehensive genetic profile. So DNA, RNA analysis, <clears throat> germline, and try to characterize uh, Try to characterize cancers in a publicly available database. This is a research tool, hopefully to point people in the right direction and say, all right, here, here's what, it, here's an encyclopedia to start with what, is met, what does uh, prostate cancer look like, what genes are involved. You know, this should be hypothesis generating. And when you look at this, and Mayo contributed a lot to this, and a lot of institutions did, some of these things are already known, right? So we already know that ETS fusions, you know, the Tempers erg and that family of, of mutations is very common in prostate cancer. So that's here. But then we start to see other recurrent families. So a significant proportion of patients with mutations in F SPOP, also in the forkhead genes, IDH. Over here we see the, the P10 family, right? And P10 feeds into the PI3 kinase pathway. <clears throat> And this becomes a, this is kind of the, uh, this is the zoo of different types of prostate cancer, if you will. I mean, you look at this and you recognize with these different families, these different clusters happening, this ought to lead to different disease phenotypes. The genotype should at some level translate into phenotype. And if we're doing a really good job, one would hope that this starts to inform how we're treating patients. And not every patient is the same, that there's something we can say beyond Gleason to start to talk about how we can approach prostate cancer. And that sounds intuitive, you know, but the fact of the matter is we're not doing this. The fact of the matter is they do this much better in almost every other cancer. But as we see, you know, and we're familiar with this from having lived this for so many years, you know, prostate cancer lags behind the other big four tumors in terms of how we're incorporating biomarkers, how quickly we get to new therapies, in terms of the amount of research that gets applied and how we bring that benefit to our patients. So we've already looked at some of this data. This is just a different table, organizing it a bit differently. But again, em emphasizing the point, you know, here's TCGA. TCGA is primary prostate cancer. This is prostatectomy samples is what I was just showing you. This is that metastatic prostate cancer database. And one of the things, and this is the, the data we showed you earlier, one of the things that, that gets emphasized is the fact that as you move from primary prostate cancer to metastatic prostate cancer, the rates of almost all these mutations increases dramatically. Okay, so cancer is not stable. It is inherently unstable, and it evolves with time. It evolves from the time it goes from primary to metastatic, and across the timeline of the metastatic disease, it continues to evolve. So patients who get biopsied prior to first-line therapy for metastatic prostate cancer have less mutated disease than patients who get biopsied after three, four lines of therapy. With every step in the process, the cancer looks different 
and accumulates greater and greater mutational burden. So this is data coming out of one of the uh, Stand Up to Cancer Dream teams looking at metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So now we've moved from TCGA, which is primary cancer, to looking at germline defects in metastatic disease, so really what the cancer start with, started with, to now looking at what are we seeing in the castration resistant population. And this is immediately getting much more complex, right? I mean, these are cumulative mutations as the patient progresses through their disease course. At the very top here, and I know this is uh, small, at the very top here is aberrations in the androgen receptor. Most of these are gonna be amplifications of the AR. <clears throat> uh, and then, you know, the, the, uh, the ETS fusions, the P10 deletions, these are the things that are well known. These are the things that are gonna be most common. But other things that start to pop out I'm sorry, this, is, uh, this ends up being quite small. There are other pathways that are recurrently mutated here. You start talking about PI3 kinase mutations uh, or P10 deletions happening in over 20%. You start talking about AR amplification. We start talking about uh, defects in DNA repair, so BRCA, ATM, some of these others. We start talking about defects in cell cycle regulation. <clears throat> CDKN2A, other familiar genes. We start talking about defects in cell signaling, and these are all aberrations I'm highlighting here that in fact have targeted drug therapy available that have been applied in other malignancies. And these are all defects for which these targeted therapies are typically not considered in prostate cancer. So, you know, these aberrations that we talk about are not unique in prostate cancer. And this is one of the the key concepts I think that we have to understand is, you know, there's only a certain number of pathways that drive our cells. <clears throat> there's only a certain number of recurrent aberrations that are gonna drive all malignancies, whether you're talking about prostate cancer or breast cancer or colon cancer or whatever else. Prostate cancer is unique in that a healthy prostate cell is highly dependent on the AR. And as it turns out, the AR is probably the, the most powerful super regulatory gene in the human genome. It directly controls the transcription of more genes than any regulatory gene yet identified. Which is why in prostate cancer, aberration in a single pathway is enough to induce oncogenesis initially. But as I say, as we progress through the natural history of prostate cancer, the disease starts to evolve. <clears throat> and I'm gonna to touch on this later when we talk about the, or I believe it's tomorrow when we talk about other AR targeted therapies, but the disease evolves and really starts to move away from dependence on just AR. Okay, it starts to really move down a pathway towards being a generalized carcinoma, not unlike the other malignancies. And that's what these highlighted regions are really talking about. These are common pathways that are aberrant in other cancers, lung, bladder, whatnot, and pathways for which targeted therapies are potentially available. <clears throat> At the end of the day, leaving AR and, and, uh, and ETS fusions out of it, half of all patients will have some kind of targetable aberration if you add this all up. Not mutually exclusive, right? A patient may have multiple pathways that are aberrant, but ultimately at least half of our patients have something going on. And the fact of the matter is we never look for these, okay? Not a standard of care. So if we dig into this further, what we're seeing here is in A, we see copy number alterations, so that is uh, more or fewer copies of a relevant gene, suggesting the pathway is gonna be more active or less. We see in B, gene fusions. This is something that's often left out of the conversation. Now, when you're talking about all these gene panels, what we're really talking about is point mutations when you do genome testing. But genome testing, for the most part, is gonna miss fusion events. And it's just because of the way the technology works when we read across the genome, you know, these sequencers, they use, they use inserts, and with the length of the insert, you'll pick up a point mutation, but it's not gonna read from gene A to gene B to tell you that these two genes are fused together. 
That information, if it's picked up, is generally discarded by the algorithms. So if you want to find fusions, at the very least, we usually need to do transcriptomics, that is RNA sequencing. Or if we know what we're looking for, we can start doing fish testing. We can do break-apart probes and, you know, we, uh, full disclosure, I mean, I have some patents on some break-apart probes for some fusions that we found. But this is, uh, this is, uh, th this family of, of aberrations can be drivers and it's something that's not looked at in typical panels. So you think about CML, Philadelphia chromosome, this is a unique fusion protein that was discovered because it was visible on karyotype. But what we're finding now in the clinic when we're doing this in a research setting is that a lot of malignancies will have driver fusions beyond what is you know, known by any normal panel. But the fact of the matter is we're not looking for them, okay? So a driver fusion would be when you have a constitutively active gene, you know, something that should be running in a cell, and the promoter region of that will then get fused on to an oncogenic gene, which normally should not be active. So when you think about Philadelphia chromosome, BCR able, what you have is the promoter region for BCR driving able, able driving oncogenesis. So ultimately, it's a question of dysregulation of a pathway. And what we find here is that fusion events are common in prostate cancer. In fact, uh, Levi Garraway's group has described this process that they call chromothripsis. And what we find in prostate cancer is that these events will happen <clears throat> very rapidly, typically all at once. You know, evolution in cancer cells is not a continuous smooth process. It's really more of a staccato process. It happens in large leaps and bounds rather than at any kind of definable steady state. And fusion events will happen in a prostate cancer, uh, in a prostate cancer cell where there will be multiple fusions across the genome from you know, chromosome one to three, and then that same partner in three to six, and the same partner in six back to one, the second partner in one over to nine, and nine over to 23, or 21. And so you'll end up with 10 fusions at one event happening immediately. And these can then end up being drivers. What they looked at in this data set was they said, which one of these events seems to be associated with aggressiveness, uh, associated with, uh, with enrichment in metastatic disease versus early disease? And no surprise, TP53 pops out. Now, P53 is a single most mutated gene across all cancers, right? This is a, a cell cycle regulator. When you lose it, you have increased mutational rate. And of course, the AR pops out. But in other things, reliably, I mean, this. This passes a sniff test, it's the things you'd expect, BRCA, MLL2, APC, whatnot. Other things don't appear, to be, uh, don't appear to be relevant. But ultimately then, you can start to talk about, again, what are the driver mutations, right? Amplifications, you know, you're talking about AR, gene fusions, actually quite common. And then this list here, breaking down a bit further, what I was talking about of actionable mutations in metastatic CRPC. We're not looking for this, right? In most prostate cancer patients, no one looks for this information. You know, but I, I always emphasize, you know, you can't find it if you don't look for it. And the eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know. If you, if you don't first become familiar with the data, become familiar with the, the aberrations that are accumulating, become comfortable with the data, then frankly, presenting the data makes no difference at all, right? Repetition matters, familiarity matters. We need to know what we're looking at when we see it. So biomarker driven treatment is common in essentially every other cancer. You know, when we think about the big four, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, the, these four tumors represent 48% of all cancer diagnoses in the United States, you know, ex excluding just the, the little skin cancers, okay? So in breast cancer, you have ERPR, HER2, and colon cancer, KRAS, BRAF, NRAS, lung cancer, a variety of markers, EGFR, ALK, ROS1. Melanoma, you know, only kills 8,000 people a year. A fraction of what we see with prostate cancer has a long list of relevant known biomarkers. In prostate cancer today, there is not a single FDA-approved biomarker because we haven't incorporated this into the way we do clinical trials, into the way we think about our patients. You know, we, we, 
we've been doing docetaxel for 20 years now, and we have a dozen negative docetaxel plus X studies where we added a second drug. And I would argue with you that this is a failure of trial design. If you go back to the early HER2 studies in breast cancer, you know, you're talking about 15% of patients having this aberration. And, and if a patient has HER2 amplification in breast cancer, the likelihood of response is dramatically higher, several fold higher than if they're negative. And if they had done an unselected study in breast cancer, then that study would have been at least 3,000 patients in order to try and detect a clinically significant difference when we talk about applying p-value. Okay, and that's, that's ultimately the trick in order to get FDA approval. If you don't have the biomarker, if you have the biomarker, then they can get away with a 500 patient study and you have drug approval. And yet in prostate cancer, we're not incorporating biomarkers into any of our studies. So I would argue that progress in prostate cancer has been held back by nihilism, by conservatism, by a field where we say, look, we're doing well enough, you don't need to push. Uh, you know, this, this, the, the, these patients, they're old, it's all right, don't hurt them, right? We've heard this. So how are we gonna get there? I mean, we've heard about BRCA. We've heard some about ARV7. ARV7, I mean, if you haven't heard about it, the, the issue here is that the androgen receptor <clears throat> can undergo splice variation where part of the receptor will be truncated. This is initially described by our colleagues at, at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, you know, back in, in the 2000 knots, I think it was about 2004 that the first description of this came out. But you know, here we are 2017 and you've only really been hearing about this in the conferences for about two years now. And so what ends up happening with ARV7, this is an inducible biomarker, okay, something that can come and go in a prostate cancer cell. When you have a, when you have a full length AR, which is always present, it's floating in the cytoplasm, and it needs to complex with testosterone in order to then migrate into the nucleus, bind to the DNA, and cause uh, cell proliferation and growth. Okay, so the, the androgen receptor is a cyt cytoplasmic protein that exhibits its activity by binding to DNA, whereas ARV7 doesn't need to complex with testosterone can independently form a heterodimer either with another truncated ARV7 or over here with the full length AR and cause activation of DNA replication. So this is why ARV7 matters. It means that the prostate cancer can continue to use the AR pathway independent of the ligand, independent of testosterone. And so this leads to a predictable outcome and this is a variety of small studies, all small studies, all single institution, using a variety of different platforms to test for ARV7. But what you see here is that, and look here, PSA response in patients with and without ARV7, right? The response in patients with ARV7 to abiraterone and enzalutamide is essentially zero, okay? Here again, 7%, here 0% versus what we expect, you know, this 40 to 70% in patients without ARV7. In chemotherapy, it has little impact. Okay? ARV7 does not predict for response to chemotherapy. This is the number we expect for cabazitaxel in the second line setting if you go back to the tropic study. Okay, so ARV7, it appears to be a relevant biomarker for the prediction of response to androgen-directed therapy versus chemotherapy in prostate cancer. And yet, you know, the first clinical trial that tried to test this failed for lack of accrual. So this is how the field handicaps itself, right? We need to drive forward with looking at biomarkers in order to better select care and risk stratify patients. But when the trial comes up, we fail to accrue it. So the question here, and th th this is what I'm getting at, this is how I think about cancer, and, and I'm gonna show you this more specifically in, in, the, uh, in tomorrow's talk about AR-directed therapies. I think traditionally, very simplistically, we used to think about linear evolution in cancer. You know, you have an in initial initiating event, you have this, you know, carcinoma in situ population, this early stage population, but as a disease starts to accumulate mutations and become more aberrant, then you start to get your more aggressive disease. 
But of course, the reality is not like that. I think we all know this intuitively, right? Evolution is branched. You know, A can go in this direction, it can go in that direction, it can go over here, and then you get further populations. And what you end up with, you know, once you get a, a tumor that's a centimeter in size, I mean, you've got a billion cancer cells in there. And they're not all identical, they're cousins. And what you have then is heterogeneity. And this has been clearly demonstrated across a variety of malignancies now. You know, in the early days of genomics, you know, showing heterogeneity in one cancer was enough for a New England Journal paper, even though one would think it's intuitive. But now it's demonstrated. We could say it's true. And so this is a demonstration then of, tumor, of prostate cancer tumor heterogeneity. This is a patient in whom tissue was taken from multiple metastatic sites. You can see it over here. And all of the different sites were then, uh, were then sequenced, and this was done across a variety of patients. And the reason I show this is one of the immediate questions that comes up is people say, fine, you biopsy a tumor, you found a mutation, but you know, you showed one site. The other metastatic site has a different mutational profile. The other metastatic site has a different mutational profile. How are you going to use that information? This is the nihilism part of it, right? There's too much data. You can't possibly dig into this. But what we see from patients like this, in fact, is that the intratu while intratumoral heterogeneity does exist, the amount of heterogeneity from the, between the different tumors in a patient is far less than the amount of heterogeneity that you see between patients. So Mr. Jones is Mr. Smith, their tumors will look very different. But you look at the five tumors within Mr. Jones, and the fact of the matter is, yes, they're different, but they're not that different. And it goes back to the fact that Tumor evolution is, is a um, cumulative process. The early mutations are the most likely to be drivers, and the fact of the matter is those early mutations don't disappear. So they're still relevant. Is it perfect data? No. We heard yesterday a lot of arguments about why it's impossible to use the data meaningfully. Yes, it's difficult, but it's not meaningless because it is, there are recurrent aberrations. We can start to develop themes, we can start to think about major pathways and we can start to direct our research appropriately if we're looking at the cumulative data. This is a demonstration of 10 patients talking about the same thing, talking about how do the mutations happen. And what these, uh, what these kind of charts are showing is here on the trunk, here are the mutations that are seen as common amongst all the different metastatic sites. And we start to draw these lineage maps saying, here is how the tumor evolves. Here's another branch, here's another branch. This is really the reality of that branch versus linear evolution I'm talking about. But again, you, if you look across, you, you, you can read it, but if you look across at the branches, the trunks, that is, for all the patients, each line here is a different patient, you see, that in fact, that the trunks are very different. Again, emphasizing the point that intrapatient heterogeneity is far greater than intratumoral heterogeneity within a patient. Subclonal populations do share characteristics, so even one biopsy is information we can act on. And if you haven't seen this picture, it's, a, it's, it's something you do need to see. I mean, this, this was, a, I think, a seminal paper when it first came out. This is a series of rat, rapid autopsies. So patients died of metastatic prostate cancer. They were taken for rapid autopsy. All their metastatic sites were excised. And then the clonal populations within the tumors were examined. Now, you know, for years we've heard arguments, you know, some people would say, look, um, lymph nodes can't metastasize. All metastases come from the primary. Take the primary out, you're not going to get further metastases. X, Y, Z, lots of arguments like that. And, and I think on the surface they were always too simplistic. And it didn't make much sense. Cancer is not that fragile. But nevertheless, the arguments persisted. What this is showing is the migration of metastases, clonal populations. So you go back to those branched maps I was showing you. We can demonstrate lineage relationships, familial relationships with those kinds of maps. And you look at this patient here, it's a remarkable picture, or this one. And what this is demonstrating is, you know, metastasis 1B came off very early from the prostate cancer. But then metastasis 1B ended up seeding a number of other populations. Some of these populations eventually fed back and repopulated the prostate, which then sent out further metastases, which then refed the prostate and fed other metastatic sites. Okay? 
So the point is the metastatic process, the proliferative process, is an interplay between all of the sites of disease. There is no magic in lymph nodes. There's no magic in the primary. There's no magic in any of the metastatic sites. Where the cancer lives is not the key to how it behaves, okay? So, so what does this mean in my clinic? There's over 100, or over 200 approved targeted cancer therapies, approved. When you talk about those that are in phase one clinical trials, you know, a large part of my footprint's in the phase one clinic, we can expand that list dramatically. Potentially targeted therapies that are approved. But when you talk about non-AR targeted therapies in prostate cancer, we've got none even though at least half of all prostate cancers will have aberrations that should be exploitable by currently available therapies for other cancers. So the question is, do I do tumor sequencing? Yes, I do. I approach tumor sequencing like people vote in Chicago, early and often, okay? I like to look at tumor evolution. I look at the primary, I look at their first metastasis, I look at their next metastasis after every line of therapy and what I know from having done that over and over is that the tumors do evolve, that these mutations are cumulative, and you start to get a sense of which one of these aberrations are happening early, right? Which pathways are, are more relevant in hormone-sensitive disease versus castration-resistant disease versus post-chemo, post-ABI, post-ENZA, pick your drug. And this is important because for the medical oncologist, you know, treatment, a treatment decision is not just about what I want to do today. When I'm thinking about my patient, I'm thinking about their entire disease course. I'm thinking about an entire treatment arc from today to five years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now, when we've been through multiple lines of therapy. Because I need to think about how to sequence the drugs in the optimal way. And that's what I'm gonna talk about more in tomorrow's talk, okay, to, to an extent. We want to get the most out of the cumulative course of care, not just out of this step, okay? Clonality and evolution are long recognized clinical realities. We know this in the clinic, you know, you give a patient docetaxel and five of their 10 tumors shrink, five of them grow. These are different cell populations. So the only way we're gonna understand what are the differences between these populations is by examining them, right? Not, not just by watching them in our imaging studies. All right, I know I'm out of time. Let's see, uh, ask the same question again. Which of these pathways is commonly aberrant in prostate cancer? All right. Very good. Something I said stuck. It's good. All right, so uh, in the ARV7 question again, which of the following is true regarding the impact of ARV7 on the response to therapy in castration-resistant prostate cancer? That's right, no, no impact on the response to chemotherapy. This is Max Planck, you know, Nobel Prize winner in physics, right? German scientist, had a lot of very good quotes back in the day, and I find it useful to go back to. When you change the way it look at things, the things you look at change. If you don't think about the genomic profile of a cancer, then you only have one cancer. Prostate cancer is one monolithic disease without a recognition of the subpopulations and the subtypes that exist within that monolith. Experiment is the only means of knowledge at our disposal. Everything else is poetry and imagination. We are not trying to be snake oil salesmen, just making things up so that it sounds good. What we're trying to do is actually develop a database of knowledge that can lead to hypothesis-driven research to get to experimentation, to get to definable knowledge that's translatable. And this, this last one I think is important. I mean, this is the one that gets paraphrased as science only advances one death at a time. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. So this is unfortunately all too true right? A lot of times we, we stick with what we learned early on or more to the point, research, you know, researchers are like parents, right? We all think that our baby is the prettiest. So we invested 30 years of our life proving a certain point 
And then that point changes because new research comes around, and, and it's very unlikely that that researcher is willing to give up on what they believe, right? We don't have to be stuck in that paradigm. In, in cancer therapy, evolution is far too quick for that. In prostate cancer, we have new drugs being approved every single year. We, I mean, we, we have, prostate cancer has dominated ASCO for the last five years or so with plenary after plenary after going decades with very little attention whatsoever. So sequencing certainly is about moving forward quickly. It's certainly something that I'm not saying is easy to do, but it is something that we need to do in order to move the field. 